D&D has some very strange features in its implicit world building. Chief among these are the spells. These are discrete units and uses of magic, which can do strange and very specific things. But one set of D&D spells has an unbelievably outsized impact, assuming we're trying to apply a, a modern ethical standard. Would you eat something? that can talk back. Cutting right to the chase, a few features of D&D's design allow people to talk to plants and animals. There's the first level, speak with animals. Furbolgs can communicate intelligibly one way to beast, plants and quote all vegetation. Speak with plants is a third level spell that lets druids, bards and rangers imbue plants within 30 feet with limited sentience and animation. And that's not counting the fact that any given beast could be a druid in disguise. Any plant or animal might have been awakened or any tree could be a dryad's home. Seeing as much of our real life survival has come through skills in farming, foraging and feeding off the natural world, what on earth does all of this complexity imply for how we eat? It is worth noting that unless we're specifically discussing a colony of furbolgs, these concerns are likely not the highest priority in a world where fantasy species are fighting for survival. I mean, for goodness sake, it's not like the goblins can be caught philosophizing before dragging away their haul of new human meat. So unless your civilization has a lot of free time or a strong connection with nature, like elves in both cases or furbolgs especially in the latter, this is most likely a post-enlightenment issue to deal with. But that does mean that any D&D society will eventually come across the burning question, which of the things in the world is it okay to eat? The clearest and most immediate answer to the concerned philosopher is to find a way to only subsist on magical foods, most simply good berries, but also food made through create food and water. They may, even to be fully in the clear, choose to drink only magically summoned water, as beer and wine both consist of plant matter. After all, you never know if you're consuming a nymph or naiad soul home from a freshwater source, best stick to the magic stuff. Of course, our neurotic philosopher is taking things to extremes, but it is a genuine concern for any civilized folk. Do you feel justified eating something you can easily have a conversation with? Now, your personal answer may be no. Perhaps you simply don't care if you had a conversation with your meal moments prior. In our world, this would likely make you a cannibal, or someone who enjoys the taste of parrot. In a D&D &D world, well, it's complicated. Eating centaur or dwarf is probably almost universally frowned upon, but goblin? Manticore? Rabbit? Where's the line between cannibalism and eating some damn meat? Well, goblins and manticores can talk whenever they so choose, but the rabbit could only talk in the right circumstances. It is complicated. I think most civilized folks would object to eating a sapient humanoid except in the most dire of cases, be that through ethical, moral, squeamishness or simply decorum reasons. So what is it about a dwarf or a goblin that gives us pause when it comes to consuming them? Is it because they're ostensibly people? Because they look like us? Uh, 
Well, personhood is a ridiculously complex topic that I hope to tackle in a future video, but in my mind it really all boils down to relatability. Generally, animals used for meat are abstracted from ourselves. Most would rather eat a chicken than a gorilla. Heck, in the West we have so many euphemisms for meat, especially in English, from beef to steak, medallions to chops, will go a long way to actively avoid describing the animal we're eating, or even the parts of muscle that we are choosing to consume. This isn't an ethical choice, it's a practical one, a linguistic one, that separates the food from the creature. Except in the case of chickens, because we have very little sympathy for some reason for chickens. But generally, it becomes more strange to eat something the more we relate to it. Throughout history, we as humans have almost always avoided eating our pets, especially when there is other food available. Often throughout history, dogs and cats have been buried with some sort of funerary honours as opposed to being used to feed the pigs. This makes some sense. It is a very human trait to find things out in the world that are relatable to us and attempt to socialise with them. So with all that said, what are some potential responses to the problem posed by being able to talk to plants and animals in D&D? Firstly, you can simply dismiss all of these concerns. Sure, some magical folks can talk to plants and animals, but that doesn't affect the common man. After all, we've been rearing animals and farming plants for generations, and they've never bothered to complain before. Maybe all this magic is just a trick. Anyway, maybe you're not actually giving these things a voice, but hallucinating or conjuring up some imagined speech using magic. Surely these plants and animals can't be people all the time. You're just essentially puppeting them for a bit. So in sum, all this magic nonsense and philosophy doesn't change the reality for regular sceptical folk. It's just absurd navel-gazing by people who keep accidentally creating sentient creatures using magic out of the formless eldritch void. If anything, it just makes magic look, one, silly, and two, more dangerous. Another distinctive form of denial comes in justification. Maybe these creatures actually want to be eaten. After all, some insects and far more plants rely on being eaten to complete their life cycles and reproduce. Death is part of life, after all, and if the top of the food chain were to just disappear, there may actually be some pretty disastrous ecological knock-on effects. Proponents of these ideas might even suggest that animals even discussed with, with magic, uh, understand their place in the natural order. Perhaps beasts simply don't have souls, although technically in some uh, canonical settings of D&D, &D, uh, the Beastlands might disprove that. Or, or perhaps their ideal post-death situation for their bodies is to be consumed by another creature. The only people who claim animals and plants can talk to them either have a vested interest in protecting the natural wild world, or have magic. How can we trust them that these creatures are actually intelligent and unwilling to serve a greater purpose in death? Besides, we know we're sapient creatures, and we can't subsist without eating something. Having animals, and even plants in some extreme cases, off the menu is just silly. Many reasonable folks, upon hearing that some plants and animals can be as smart as any regular person, and also that they can move around, especially weird in the plants case, might decide that it's at least good to check before you eat something. 
trying to slaughter a pig only to find out it was a druid in disguise, or the awakened advisor to some strange wizard would be a pretty bad turn of events for your average person. So it's generally just a good idea to check if the animal you're about to kill is able to communicate. Farmers may make an even greater habit than nowadays of talking to livestock, and animals that seem to display understanding or sense may find themselves saved from the butcher's blade. This last test before slaughtering may be a sort of neck verse, but for animals, except instead of reciting the Bible to avoid execution, it's just required for the animal to display some semblance of sapience. This may also get used to uh, save a few of the farmer's favourite animals, or might lead to a small cottage industry of supposedly awakened animals. They might perform feats of calculation, speech, or prediction, even if none of them are actually awakened. This would be much like the uh, octopus that predicted the World Cup, or horses that stamped out calculations, except perhaps on a broader scale in the knowledge that such magics are actually a thing, people might be much more fascinated, even if most of the presented intelligent beasts are fake. For plants, perhaps a prayer offered to the gods of the harvest has a pause in it, where all men will be silent, to offer an awakened plant a chance to make itself known. If this practice is old enough, perhaps the reason for it is lost to the generations, so the emergence of a voice from the corn might be deeply disturbing, unless it's one of the local youths playing tricks. I would expect that this position likely forms a baseline assumption of a D&D world, as nobody wants to accidentally kill a wizard's familiar a hag's favourite tree, or the druid's squirrel poker buddy. Some people may go so far as to swear off consuming creatures that could potentially talk. This is not as unreasonable as it might sound. After all, magic that allows people to communicate with creatures can't invent a whole new personality, and it's unlikely to be a complete hallucination as these creatures often give specific, pertinent information which uses their own life and experiences as examples. So the spells can't be just forcing creatures to think in that moment. They have life experience, they have personalities prior. The spells must merely allow them to communicate their prior extant thoughts in our language. This means that the complex mental structures that allow for conversation, causal links, pain, and learning must already exist in such creatures, and potentially also in plants. This all follows as an argument fairly logically. So essentially, by having the ability to talk to other living things, we begin to realise that, well, what we eat largely doesn't matter. It's all thinking living creatures that feel pain and understand what is happening to them. Every slaughtered creature causes death and harm to living things that think that death and harm both kind of suck. You could try and minimise harm by only eating huge creatures, reducing the number of deaths. You could go by perceived intellect, eating easily panicked and forgetful chickens over shrewd and observant pigs, or you could bite the bullet and be vegetarian, assuming that at least not having to kill every plant is in some way good for your karma. Subsisting on a diet of the perishable leavings of, of, of plants, like corn or potatoes or fruit, is maybe an option, but 
does it necessarily allow you to survive long term? And does it even make a difference? You're still causing these plants, which most likely can feel things, pain. Is there a heaven for plants? Should we adopt a fruitarian diet in our fantasy world? Uh, probably not, if there's no magically created superfood, we will die. In a world where one's immortal soul provably rests in the balance based upon your actions, is knowingly killing provably intelligent creatures to eat them just to improve one's quality of life, a justifiable reason that you should be eternally punished. It's possible that vegetarian cults may spring up quite quickly and forcefully in agrarian regions or among philosophers or noble folks. Debates would likely be had among scholarly and magical elites concerning the exact nature of these magical communications with other beings. And of course, the issue, the thorny issue of plant ensoulment and the implications of all of this. I can see it being and it's something of an inflection point in certain societies where those who lived before the food reforms are considered to be savage beasts and only the enlightened modern folk have the right way to live and eat. There would certainly be resistance to these movements, folks suggesting that this is all silly navel-gazing, that having a conversation with a creature doesn't mean that you shouldn't also kill and eat it. It's likely that these reformists won't be in the majority, unless magic food becomes more commonplace. Really, in a fantasy world of any sort, Goodbury is a ridiculous game changer. Someone with a relatively minor talent for the magical arts can create 10 or 20 instant meals, which completely fill up those who consume them for an entire day. It's one of the most significant steps possible in famine prevention, nutritional efficiency, and labour saving. With judicious castings of this spell and compulsory training for anyone who has any sort of talent who might be able to learn this spell, an entire civilization could be fed every day simply through this one magic, if it were socially minded and organised enough. With no actual need for agrarian labour, such a society would be free to do more in the knowledge that no one will ever be food insecure, and maybe some crops are still grown for luxuries. It's, p it's possible. It seems kind of like a dream. If it works. And that's the thing. Is magically created food infinite? Does it cause a strain on the world, or magic, or the economy? <sighs> Is this a situation where, like under the dark sun of Athos, magic has a tangible cost, draws something out of the environment? And so this is not a sustainable way of feeding people. Is it truly consequence free? Accepting, of course, the total destruction of any agrarian economy and the loss of thousands of jobs. And most crucially of all, are people willing to accept their single daily berry as everything they get to eat in a day? I really, really doubt it. Hypocrisy and uh, two-stage systems are the death of any communitarian movement. I fear that this may be no different, but what I would say is that any druid grove Firbolg Settlement, Ranger, or Wood Elf Conclave may well find themselves adopting exactly such a system. After all, it would be hard to kill and eat something when it can tell you to your face in your language that you would be murdering it. Thank you for watching. I, I hope that this has inspired some of those world-building thoughts, and 
that the comments don't turn into a raging dumpster fire. Please be civil, folks. Please also let me know if there's any topics, spells, or weird niches that need a world-building deep dive of their own in the comments. And subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. But with that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.